This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 24th, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 322, and Merry Christmas. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this special edition, the year-end edition of the MMA panel, I'm joined by Mario Canseco of Research Co. and Andy Yan of Simon Fraser University to look back at the stories that mattered to British Columbia in 2023. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. It's the MMA panel at the end of 2023. Joining me is Mario Canseco, the president of Research Co. He's the other M. And the A is Andy, the director of the city program at Simon Fraser University. Together, the three of us, were the MMA panel. We get together every once in a while to uh, rate and debate uh all things relevant to British Columbians and beyond. Now, 2023, uh, if you remember, that, that was the uh, the year that marked the disappearance and the implosion of the Titanic tourist submarine that captured the world's attention for about a week earlier in 2023. Then there was the, the October 7th massacre now that bumped the Ukraine war out of the headlines. Uh, uh, in Canada, you couldn't get headlines anymore on Facebook, thanks to the Trudeau Liberals' Bill C-18. Uh, They settled with Google, but not settled yet with Facebook. Uh, Elon Musk turned Twitter into X, and Pierre Polyev uh, changed his image, uh, took off his glasses and and toured the country, went and chomped on an apple in the Okanagan. And of course, uh, Sphere opened in Las Vegas, the future of live entertainment. Uh, You two brought a -a one-of-a-kind concert experience that will have ripple effects elsewhere in the world from a technological standpoint. 2023 year in review here on the Breaker.News podcast. It was a year of interference, the foreign kind, not only China interfering in Canada, but uh, incidents of India and Iran too. Ignition, wildfires burned forests coast to coast to coast, including the Okanagan. Immigration, Canada reached the 40 million milestone on June 16th, and it just kept growing. Uh, Here we are, about 40.5 million or so. Uh, And inflation, the economy, uh, overarching. Uh, We'll start off with Mario Canseco. Which of those four eyes uh, is your top rank of the year? Uh, I would rank inflation as a top one, Bob. Uh, The reason is it's making people very upset with governments. And there's a group of residents of the country that is deeply dissatisfied with the status quo, and that is everybody age 35 to 54. Uh, You have young kids, you have aging parents, everything is more expensive, groceries are higher, and this is the group that was essentially voting for Justin Trudeau because they wanted somebody young and more, uh, you know, center-left minded calling the shots, and now that generation is looking 10 years after and going, well, maybe this isn't what we hope for. You know, we're starting to get a little bit dissatisfied, and it's a very important component of every election. We we always say, you know, young people don't vote, 55 and overs vote more. Uh, But when you lose that middle bracket, you are in for a heap of trouble. And I think that is going to be the part where the liberals need to get their act together and talk about issues, particularly housing, the cost of living. Uh, This is a group that they require, and they're not going to get it back uh, unless uh, life becomes a little bit easier for them. Andy, and uh, what do you rank as uh, your top eye of the four eyes of 2023? Uh, interference, uh, ignition, immigration, or inflation? Well, my first reaction is beware the eyes of 2023. <laughs> that I think that you've kind of summarized, I think, what I, a lot of Canadians are struggling and uh, are facing, in, the, in the, whether it's across the country or in metropolitan in Vancouver or in the city of Vancouver. And I think that I, I, I agree with Mario in terms of the role of inflation, but I actually think the, the slight 
edge maybe immigration, but immigration as a proxy towards the issue of housing. And of course, that then goes back to inflation. But then I think when it comes to concerns around housing, around the affordability of housing, now, not only in the city of Vancouver or across metropolitan Vancouver, it's now, I think, a political existential question that has now occurred with uh, the the issue of how do you deal with a growing population that is uh, th that is part of this uh, this th this immigration trend. But then I think within the the issue of immigration is the details of who they are. That it isn't necessarily we're talking about wealth immigration that came in from previous times, but we're talking about labor immigration and really the kind of profound challenges that comes down to our labor as well as our demographics. But then I think we talked about immigration. I think we inherently need to talk about foreign interference, and that is connected up to the kind of global nature and the forces that are shaping Canadian politics, that it wasn't just only the role of what's going on in China and and the uh, and, 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 and the lack interference, although one reads the kind of stories coming out of Sam Cooper's discoveries, which makes one feel a bit of dread, a bit of dread, but then also the role of what's going on in Iran, what's going on in India, and perhaps even some roles in terms of Russia, the Russia-Ukrainian uh, conflict coming in towards domestic politics. I think all of which talks about how we now have a global, uh, well, a, a renewed global set of uh, politics that are uh, landing into our local politics, our, our, our local ones. Um, and then very much, I think, covers it all now is really the role of ignition, is climate action, that climate change, that that is something that is inescapable. And that, uh, you know, some people said that if you think the if you think the pandemic was something, it was really the trailer to the the ongoing challenges, the 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 big, even bigger challenges when we think about climate uh, climate change and the need for climate action. Now, here in British Columbia, we saw the NDP roll out in the fall session of the legislature the most aggressive housing laws in British mm -hmm. Columbia history. They took away power from municipalities and municipal voters and imposed uh, various housing targets. They uh, uh, waved a magic wand basically with the majority and said that towers can be built uh, in an 800 meter radius of uh, transit hubs, uh, not just SkyTrain stations, but bus loops. This isn't gonna be solved by October when the election is scheduled to happen. We're probably going to see a lot more real estate uh, and construction company CEOs and their families and friends write their uh, individual donation checks to the NDP between now and then. Um, of course, this is all pending economically because uh, our developers in this economy uh, with high interest rates and high inflation, high cost of construction and labor, um, are they going to greenlight any new projects this year that uh, could uh, you know, come to fruition three, four, or five years down the road? W will they take advantage of this uh, streamlined uh, reality at uh, municipal halls where they don't have to have public hearings for most things anymore? Andy, w where do you think this is going? Do you think that this NDP strategy will, in the long term, mean a better housing cheaper housing for British Columbians, or will it benefit the same real estate barons and construction barons who have been uh, benefiting for years? Well, that's really part of the kind of key questions that are involved here, that by shifting the kind of responsibilities for development, uh, what's going to happen? Because in that shift of responsibilities, it didn't necessarily come with a shift in revenue that we don't necessarily see the kind of, I think, um, the need or, or even the assessment of infrastructure, that it isn't just around density numbers that we're talking about, uh, but we're, we're, we're particularly talking about where through which uh, this is emphasized, the role of transit, but the, it, it also needs to be connected and supported by infrastructure. And I think that that is, I think, something that uh, will, again, uh, we will we'll see how how it comes out, how I think uh, we uh, we see the, if you will, the uncertainty of of community and many contributions get shifted towards their new version of of community and many uh, many, uh, many contributions. But then also, really, I think the challenges in terms of infrastructure and the gap 
that I think is going to occur in terms of infrastructure and how it's going to be renewed, how it's going to be paid for. I think that a lot of this is also, I think, a way of stabilizing uh, the a, a stream of revenue for the province in terms of the property transfer taxes that uh, right now um, the property transfer taxes uh, to revenues from property transfer taxes actually exceed stumpage fees in the province of British Columbia, which I think attaches towards a much more pragmatic move towards a stabilization of that revenue for the province of British Columbia, whether it's intended or unintended, but you can see it's needed. But yet, I think the issue will be how that growth is supported and how it's going to be paid for and who's going to pay for it that uh it may be a win for certain developers but yet i think for others it's going to be i think one through which it's uncertain and precisely because of what's going on in terms of inflation and how many rental projects really don't pencil out anymore they used to pencil out as or as late as two years ago but now it just doesn't work but yet uh mixed into the role of of labor and materials inflation that that's also been an ongoing challenge is really the cost of labor in uh, metropolitan vancouver for which this doesn't necessarily deal with and yet also the types of housing that's going to be produced uh one one, one to a great degree it was un, it was it was wasn't really talked about the mix of housing that we'll see whether it's go, how much of it's going to be say purpose-built rental versus uh private market cond condominiums if you will much less the desperate need for non-market housing. So I think that this is really, I think, setting the stage, but we yet have yet still to see the play. Now, Martin Fonseca from Research Co. Uh, on this issue, the, the NDP has taken over as the party of real estate and construction uh, from the BC United, former BC Liberals, who are actually led by someone who is a recent former <laughs> real estate executive. Uh, the NDP has basically turned things on its head in the fall with these very aggressive laws that they essentially imposed with their majority. Um, and you contrast that with what was happening in the winter and the spring, uh, especially with the Atira and BC housing conflict of interest uh, and nepotism scandal. Uh, they work to really make it very complicated for BC United to gain some ground. Uh, it's been weeks, mm. if not months, if not years, since we heard about the dreaded 1990s and how the NDP was ruining everything and we can't let them back. Now the business community seems to be solidly behind what they're doing and what they're getting out of the other parties can be quite strange in the point of the BC Conservatives turning literally to chicken in every pot politics. Uh, BC Conservative, sorry, and and BC United really not not knowing where this is going. Is this going to be similar to what we used to have? Kevin Falcon really not connecting that well. So part of the problem is a business community that may not be really looking at the other opposition parties as choices that they would like to work with, and and this raises an issue also in the in in one other aspect, which is fundraising. Uh, the BC Conservatives amassed $52,000 in the third quarter of the year. It's not a lot, but if we start to see the numbers in the final quarter of 2023, and the BC Conservatives get a little bit closer to the six-figure mark, and you start to see a drop in the BC United fundraising, that is going to spell trouble for, the, for, for BC United. But ultimately, I think part of the situation is uh, the negativity that you might get from this is going to come from specific municipalities that aren't happy with a structure that is one size fits all. You know, what might work in Vancouver may not work in Langley or in West Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So part of the complexity for the government is how do you manage all of this? And the one thing that is missing from this conversation is a, a, a really deep discussion about the future of cities. Are we still going to build like people are showing up to work five days a week from nine to five with everybody right. working from home and right. doing things differently? So you're missing that aspect of it. It's almost like a plan that was devised pre maybe two or three years before we had COVID-19. And it right. now might not make so much sense to say we're going to fund this and put it next to all, all of these transit hubs when people are working from home more than ever. Here's an interesting stat that kind of comes into play is that when it comes to these transit oriented uh, development areas, uh, which which is going to see, uh, for example, the 22 story buildings within a 200 square meter uh, radius of a station to um, eight stories, I think from uh, to, to that goes out to 800. What's interesting to actually see is that 80% of those stations are actually in NDP writings. Yeah. That 
I think that what's really going to happen, I, I think a lot of folks don't actually know really like your ordinary regular folks don't really know what this really means. And I think what what the real, I think electoral implications, I think really are perhaps gonna come into play in terms of when the, when the buildings start taken down, when the buildings start coming up and really the kind of measure in terms of the support that could occur or, or the lack of support. So I think that it's really, I think in it, for me, it's, it's been a question of, is this, if you will, the provincial government, David Eby, the NDP, taking the game to the next level or are they scoring on their own net in terms of not necessarily understanding how different municipalities have worked that in certain cases um, they actually have much more aggressive station plans that are even proposed here but yet at the same time there are reasons why certain stations haven't developed the way, the way they haven't for example the nanaimo and 29th avenue stations have been just uh, constantly called as the reason why the the that the, the, the a a major example of where development hasn't occurred but that you know it's, it's about single detached homes in the wrong places and coming out against developments that that's not true uh one of the biggest challenges of development in between those stations is a lack of infrastructure um most people do like drinking water, they do like sewers, and the overall infrastructure around those immediate stations for now uh, really don't have that st uh, structure for now, but yet at the same time, the emphasis was to look at uh, develop other stations, if you will, because it's easier, it's more straightforward as opposed to uh, what will be happening around those two stations. Now, this was uh, David Eby's first full year in office since taking over from uh, Premier John Horgan in late 2022. Uh, it's interesting, Andy, of course, you mentioned uh, the transit-oriented development areas. Uh, that spells TOTA, which sounds like Yoda. And uh, David Eby has a Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development and Innovation, a Ministry of Jedi. We're seeing a, a thread here that uh, David Eby is a Star Wars fan. John Horgan was a Star Trek fan. Uh, science fiction governments uh, say what you will, but uh, different uh, yeah. different schools of thought here. Um, yeah, Mario Canseco, how, how would you rank David Eby's first full year in office? Well, there's a couple of things that are uh, crucial for somebody who's coming in with an unelected mandate. And, and the first one is, are you going to be able to sustain the way people feel about the government and the party? And the answer to that is yes, uh, partially because it's been held by the, the craziness that we're seeing from the center right. And also the, the missteps in the part of the BC Green Party as far as where they want to go in the next election. So, you know, part of it has been that they don't think well, uh, but the other people are doing them poorly. And that certainly helps him have a high rating uh, on his own and a high level of support for the NDP. Um, we're no longer having discussions about whether this makes sense or not. I think the fact that they jumped right into the housing file um, helps their base. It's going to keep people motivated. It's something that we've seen people complain about for years more at a municipal level. And I think it's uh, definitely smart politics to go at it and say, you know, we are the BC government, more people vote in these elections than in municipal ones. And we think we have the capacity to tell specific municipalities that are lagging what they shouldn't be doing or what they should be doing. Um, it's a risky strategy, but it's only a risky strategy if we wind up in a situation where the municipal voter becomes a larger pool. Um, we're coming off very low voter turnouts in 2022. 36% in Vancouver, lower in some areas. And we're having all of these discussions about what Surrey really wants when it's a tiny proportion of the electorate. So the real motivation here would be for municipal governments to talk about this more openly and to get people to vote for what they need to, to have done. Um, this is ultimately part of the strategy for the BC government. You know, We know that we are right now in a very good situation. We are popular. The center right is disjointed. And we're going to try to get as much done in the next few months and possibly have an election on May the 4th to continue with the theme. <laughs> Andy Yan, uh, the Duke of Data from Simon Fraser University's City Program. Uh, how do you rank David Eby's first full year as the Premier of BC? A year that uh, he tried his best to put the letter H as in housing at the top of the list, but... Uh, Healthcare continues to dog the NDP. Uh, steady stream of 
of complaints about uh, hospital care, some tragedies that have happened in hospitals to families in British Columbia, and of course, uh, the ultimate band-aid solution we never thought the NDP would do, which was uh, send British Columbia cancer patients across the line into Bellingham. Um, mm -hmm. So with that issue in mind, uh, how do you rank David Eby and his first full year as Premier? Well, that's going to be one of the big challenges is that on all those themes, they're policy which take time in terms of seeing what they do and seeing if it has an effect. Um, so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to dodge the question, but yet at the same time, I am realizing that reality and, and knowing that this is also coming in towards a, a perhaps an upcoming, and we'll be talking about it, an upcoming provincial election. Um, the grade I would give is an I for incomplete that it is something that I think we will see whether how, say, a, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens with the election, but I mean, one assumes that uh, that David Eby has a very good chance in winning this, that having that kind of renewed mandate, perhaps uh, one that is going to be as as much as, as, as he has now, that he will be moving forward in terms of additional policies that are going to make sure that these, uh, that these initial policies in terms of housing, and remember, it's predominantly housing right now, it hasn't necessarily gone into, into healthcare, much less economic development. I think that there are still some profound economic development questions uh, for the for the province and are very different across the region that we have yet to really kind of come together. So I think to 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 that extent, it's 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 an incomplete, but yet I think at the same time, I think that it's it's really uh, I think attempted to meet the, I think the key you know, headlines that many, I think voters are concerned about. Now you mentioned the letter I, but we're going to bring the focus to 12th and Camby in Vancouver on this mm -hmm. look back at uh, the year that was in 2023. And we're going to look at three other letters, ABC as in ABC Vancouver, the party mm -hmm. with a majority on city council, the party under mayor Ken Sim, uh, of course, the big news that uh, ABC made this year, they didn't uh, cut the budget, they didn't do a lot of things, they did bring the Stanley Park uh, uh, Christmas train back, uh, which is great, uh, but they also greenlit the logging of Stanley Park, they say because of the looper moth, the drought uh, could cause problems for wildfire problems in years to come, so they said we've got to take down 160,000 trees. And they haven't shown us the report, the science behind it, but guess what they did the very next week? Ken Sim announced that he was going to ask the NDP to amend the Vancouver Charter so he could uh, shut down the elected park board. So that became the big civic story of the year, late in the year. Uh, first of all, Mario Canseco with Vancouver City Hall, with Mayor Ken Sim, his first year in office. Um, I, I want you to attach a letter grade um, because it's ABC Vancouver. Do you give Ken Sim an A, a B, or a C, or another letter? <laughs> I would say it's a C, and, and there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one of mm -hmm. them is they never found the ability to make life more affordable for people. Uh, the property tax hikes were uh, particularly high, especially compared with what he campaigned on. Um, it costs more money to do business in the city of Vancouver, uh, which it, this was supposed to be a council that was, made, that was going to make things easier for small businesses, and now the license fee for your uh, for the ability to work in the city is more expensive than it was the year before. Um, similar situation when it comes down to the park board. Uh, what is actually really striking about this is that uh, we get this announcement from the Daily Hive. Uh, it's almost like there's an actual mouthpiece for the government at this stage, at the time when you know we're thinking about other ways in which this type of coverage should be happening. And it's complex because um, I just don't see a real base of support out there. You know, I know there was a lot of animosity related to how things were going under the previous mayor, uh, but we don't see the same type of gravitas from social media, for instance, as far as, you know, broken windows. We still have broken windows. We just don't have the same 10 people saying that there's broken windows right. and they're the fault of, of a, a Ken Sim. So there's a complexity there as far as where that base of support might be coming from. You know, I just don't see everybody who right. voted for ABC suddenly going, well, yeah, it's a great decision that he's taking care of the park board. And, you know, we're all on board with this. I don't think it's going to be that simple. 
And it, it raises the other question of the initial lie that we talked about, which is interference. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly what happened as far as the dealings between the campaigns in the last municipal election in Vancouver and the Chinese government. And we won't know because it's not included in the actual files that are going to be reviewed. But um, I think it's an issue that, that should be discussed much more prominently. You know, We're a year away from the moment that he took office. And we just don't see where the base is. We see a lot of tweets from councillors. We see three park board commissioners who are very upset because they're going to lose their jobs after they decided to run for ABC. Uh, but, you know, this isn't really the big tent party that was advertised. Andy Yan from the uh, city program at Simon Fraser University. How would you rank Mayor Ken Sims' first full year as mayor at 12th and Canby? The leader of the ABC Vancouver Party, do you give him an A, a B, a C, or another letter? I, I agree with Mario. I think it's it's going to be a C, but I think what's going, what's happening is that what you'll find, like I think many people who are say outside of municipal government, I think one has to also remember that uh, part of it was a mayor that didn't necessarily have as long a track record in terms of municipal government as others, um, in terms of C as in contact, that I think that it's also, I think, a C as in campaigning, that I think what you'll realize when it comes to municipal politics is that there's campaigning and then there's governing. That once you begin governing, you start looking at the ledgers, you start looking at, well, actually be the be the accountant that you are, that you're training. You're a you're a Sigma six black belt. That was a certainly one of the more memorable responses. Um, I am a level five, slightly chubby belly kind of guy, but you know, I mean, yeah, Sigma six, Sigma six. Um, but that uh, within that kind of um, designation. I think that there are sets up certain expectations. And then I think the question is how those uh, expectations are being met or not. And I think that the danger, I think one of my, my biggest uh, problems is actually how much is this has come becoming governance by Twitter, governance by X or whatever the heck we call it now, that I think what we've also come, come down is really the limitations of that type of I, I that 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 type of governance that it's myopic it misses what the big picture is it misses what the systemic causes of these problems are instead goes for the quick hits it goes for the clickbait it goes for really the most superficial actions and needs that the city uh this is the city has so i think that really well at least we have the stanley park train working that they it may not be it may be going through some barren uh barren forests but the uh, burn barren stumps, if you will, but the uh, but rest assured, the as the the Stanley Park train is now back in action. Well, thanks uh, on that note to Andy Yan, the director of the city program at Simon Fraser University, and also Mario Canseco, the president of Research Co. And I'm Mackin, Bob Mackin, uh, the Breaker News, of course. Uh, we are the MMA panel. And that is how we wrap up 2023. And we got to thank uh, all of you out there in podcast land, wherever you are in the world, uh, for uh, logging in, for downloading, for listening, uh, and, and hope we've uh, added to your uh, understanding of uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Canada, and also hope that we've uh, been able to give you a, a laugh or two along the way. Uh, thanks again to Andy Yan and Mario Canseco, and we're going to reconvene in the next edition of the Breaker.News podcast for the 2024 look ahead. We're each going to get out our crystal balls and look inside those crystal balls and, and try to tell you what to look for in 2024. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanamo bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to you and yours, your friends, your family.
Thank you for listening in 2023. Spread the word in 2024. Have a peaceful holiday season and a prosperous 2024. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 24th, 2023. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 24th of December in 1826, the eggnog riot at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, a drunken Christmas party with smuggled whiskey went awry and dozens of cadets were arrested? Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the free email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. Or follow the Breaker News as it happens on X, formerly known as Twitter. And you can support the Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash thebreakernews. And Merry Christmas. Until next week.